God has a plan. And God is busy working this plan. He's busy putting the pieces of puzzle into place. And even when we fail, even when we trip, even when something happens to us that we cannot understand, God will work with it. It will place it in his hand. Today we're going to be going to the book of Genesis and uh, we'll eventually get to Genesis chapter 37. So if you want to get ahead, you can go ahead there. Uh, We'll cover a few more scriptures before we get there. At least I'll give you an opportunity to survey some other scriptures before we get there. But uh, we'll at least go there. And uh, uh, today we're actually talking about the life of Joseph. Uh, The portion of the life of Joseph we're going to talk about today is Joseph... Uh, You know, he was a man with a dream, a man with a dream. One of the reasons why we're surveying the life of Joseph today is because in our weekly discipleship class, each Monday from six to seven, you know, we have, uh, let's see, I think we had more than 250 people sign up for our weekly discipleship class that we're doing for 13 weeks. And, uh, you know, I have been enjoying it so very, very much. And uh, one of the things that we are doing is we are learning how to study the Bible. We're learning how to have a quiet time. We're learning how to pray. We're learning how to incorporate Bible reading into our daily activities. We're learning how to think on and worry about the Bible. You know, that's called meditation. Some people say, well, I don't have time to meditate. Well, hold on. If you have time to worry, okay, that's what meditation is. Worry is just meditating on what the devil says. Worry is just meditating on all of your problems coming true. Worry is just meditating on your worst nightmare happening, okay? When we can reverse that and begin to actually to put that same uh, uh, power into action in our lives by actually taking the word of God and worrying about it coming to pass, worrying about the blessings. I know that worry is not necessarily a good word, but that's the best description of the word meditation. We're learning how to do that on a daily basis. And we're also learning about Bible reading and, uh, uh, and uh, you know, a daily consistent Bible reading along with Bible study, which are two different things. And so for the next few weeks in our Monday evening weekly discipleship class, our life-shaped classes, during the next few weeks, we are studying the life of Joseph. Joseph occupies a huge portion um, of the book of Genesis. In fact, there are 50 chapters in the book of Genesis. The life of Joseph starts in chapter 30 and goes all the way through chapter 50, 20, you know, of the you know two fifths uh, or forty percent of the book of Genesis contains or, 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 or covers the life of Joseph. He's the most prolific character in the book of Genesis. And outside of Jesus in the New Testament and all the references made to Jesus as Messiah uh, throughout the Old Testament, outside of Jesus, Joseph to me is perhaps the most important character in the Bible. I know they're all important because they're all in the chain, but it's certainly my favorite. I have learned so much. And so we're encouraging each one of those going through our life shape class to, to read and to study and to learn the life of Joseph. And uh, having had the advantage of studying his life now for 30 plus years, and I have studied it in depth, uh, I want to share some of those insights And let you know what made Joseph God's pick to carry on a covenant. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph to carry on a covenant beyond those first three patriarchs. How that Jacob, Joseph's uh, father, invested that covenant in Joseph. And how Joseph became a savior for his people and for his family and set them up to succeed in a time when famine certainly would have claimed their lives, their destinies, their fortunes, their futures. Yet Joseph 
uh, was a man that God used. Joseph, uh, by the way, you know, there are a lot of Josephs in the Bible, okay? And sometimes you don't know exactly which one they're talking about. This is the Joseph of Genesis, okay? Uh, uh, you, might, you might say, well, why in the world didn't God give, you know, people last names? Uh, you know, why, why didn't they have last names in the Bible so that we could have known? Well, you know, many of them were identified by last names. You may even remember Jesus referred to Simon. Remember Simon Peter? He referred to Simon Peter as Bar-Jonah. Simon Bar-Jonah, that was his last name. What in the world does that mean? Well, uh, uh, Bar is, is, uh, means the son of in Greek, and, and uh, Jonah translates uh, John. So his name was Peter Johnson. <laughs> that was his name, Peter Johnson. Okay, uh, and, uh, you know, so this particular uh, 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 Joseph we're talking about is Joseph Jacobson. Okay, okay never mind. That didn't go over his, but that's uh, if you need some help keeping it straight. But then there are two Joseph Jacobsons because Mary's husband, Joseph, he was the son of a Jacob. So uh, what do you do? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Am I confusing you yet? Some of you love this stuff and some of you go, Whoosh. just tell me who we're talking about. The Joseph we're going to talk about today was the firstborn son of a woman named Rachel. Rachel was the second wife of Jacob. Jacob was the son of Isaac. Isaac was the son of Abraham. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. Joseph was born in Syria. You can read about it from Genesis 30 all the way through to Genesis 50. That Joseph was born at a very particular time. He was born in the land of Syria at the house of Jacob's wife and her, uh, her father. The man's name was Laban, an uncle to Jacob. Jacob had married into this family, into his uncle's family. And he had served his uncle for 14 years. And during that 14 years, seven years for one wife and seven years for another, that's, you know, uh, that, that was his payment for seven years of hard labor. And it seemed to him like just a day that those 14 years had gone by because he was working for, for, uh, you know, for love and for passion. And so at the end of 14 years, his wife, Rachel, was barren. She could not have children. And so they interceded to God, and, 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 and uh, after some prayer, God opened up Rachel's womb. And after 14 years of Jacob living in that country of Syria, Rachel conceived and had Joseph. Now, that was a very particular time in, in, Joseph's, uh, or in Jacob's life. Because he had just paid in full. He had just uh, paid his whole debt. And, uh, you know, after working 14 years for two women, he was ready to go back home. He had 11 sons now that had been born to him in this 14 years. He was ready to go back home. Uh, he had gotten what he came for. He wanted to go back and to begin to build his inheritance because his father Isaac had bestowed upon him the blessing of the firstborn before he left the land of Canaan. But since arriving at his uncle's house, uh, Jacob had grown in responsibilities. He came there as a young man of 77 years old. Wow, did you realize Jacob was that old whenever he got to his uncle's house? 77 or 78? Now he has 11 sons. He's 92 years old, 91 or 92. And he wants to go back home to see his daddy, okay? But while he has been there, his responsibilities had really grown. And while he was at his uncle's house, his uncle's wealth really increased because God's blessing was on Jacob and everything Jacob touched the Lord made it to prosper. And no one knew this more than Jacob's uncle Laban. You know, Jacob's uncle Laban did not want Jacob to go back home because God was blessing everything in his house. And so he did not want Jacob to leave his employ. Uh, but uh, it happened that after some discussion, 
that a new agreement was reached. You know, uh, Jacob's uncle Laban said, what shall I give you? Stay with me. What can I give you? And he said, well, you don't have to give me anything. I'll just keep working for you. And I'll just take all of the spotted and speckled goats for my inheritance. Because, you know, normally white goats and white sheep are born. He said, just give me the spotted and speckled and brown ones. And we'll take them three days away so none of them mix. And out of the pure white goats and sheep, out of these pure white uh, animals, those that produce a multicolored offspring, that will be my, um, um, my payment. So Uncle Laban, he, he kind of was a cheater anyway. He said, yeah, let's go for it. And so um, he worked another six years under those conditions. And then when Joseph was six years old, after Jacob, coinciding with Jacob having been away from home for 20 years, he worked 14 years for his two wives. Then six years after Joseph was born, he worked for his, his uh, pay of those sheep. After 20 years of being gone, he realized that his time in Syria was over. And Jacob moved his family back to the land of Canaan. They first settled in the plains of Shechem. Shechem in the Old Testament, you can read about it. It's also called the city of Sychar. It's also the very same place that we might identify as Samaria or as they call it in, in Hebrew, Shomron. Uh, and the, the area there is the same area that Abraham first came to the land and built the very first altar. Jacob comes back from Syria with his family. Joseph is six years old. And his very first experience in this new land happens right there where Abraham built the very first altar to God. Now, when, uh, when Jacob brought his family back to this land, he bought a piece of land in Shechem. Okay? He bought this piece of ground from a man named Hamor. And this piece of ground figures heavily into Joseph's continual heart and passion for the land of Canaan. In fact, Jacob, Joseph's father, when Joseph was six years old, Jacob built an altar in this land. He built an altar right near the site of the altar where Abraham had built his first altar. This was some 150 years after Abraham had come into the land. Now, I know that I'm bogging you down with a little bit, but we're going somewhere, okay? Painting a historical picture. Go with me here so that you can... Uh, let me recap where we are right now so we can launch, okay? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob moved to Syria at 77 or 78 years old. He was not married. In Syria, he moved to his uncle's house. He married two of his uncle's daughters, okay? One was Leah and one was Rachel. He worked 14 years to pay that dowry. After 14 years, he had 11 sons and two wives, but he had no money. And he wanted to go home and began to work on his own wealth. His uncle said, don't go. Keep working for me. So he worked another six years. And in that six years, he became very wealthy. He moves back then into the land of Canaan. And the very first city in the land of Canaan he comes to is the very first place his great-grandfather Abraham came to. Abraham built the first altar in the land of Canaan right there. Jacob digs a well right there. The well of Jacob is still there. It's called the well of Sychar. It's the well where Jesus met the little woman at the well in Samaria. That same well. That particular place, Jacob bought a piece of ground. He built an altar. And he called the name of the altar, God Prevails. The God of Israel. Now realize, Israel was not a land at that time. Israel was a person. It was him. He said, basically, this is the altar to my God. My God is the God that prevails, and I'm building an altar to my God who prevails. Well, you know, with reason, 
this would have affected this young six-year-old Joseph. Joseph was six years old. He sees his dad move his family a great distance and build an altar and call upon the God that prevails. You know, there's something powerful about a young child. You know, a a very impressionable four, five, six, seven-year-old young child. There's something impressionable about a young child, this young child named Joseph, for example, that sees the dedication of his parents, how dedicated they are to the things of God, that they're not just trying to make a living, they're not just trying to make a life, They are also dependent upon God. It's very important that our young children see our dependence and watch us as we display a heart of dedication to the things of God because it affected young Joseph. It affected him so much that over 100 years later, remember Joseph was six years old when his dad built this altar there, bought this piece of ground. Over a hundred years later, in fact, it was a hundred and four years later, Joseph was still alive. And it was on his deathbed, living in Egypt at 110 years old, that he thought about that piece of ground. He thought about what his dad had done. He thought about what he saw at six years old. Even though he'd been living in Egypt for 93 years. Even though he was separated from his family for decades. Even though he had gone through a hard life and been in prison and been wrongfully accused. And he had you know, gone through terrible things. He thought about, on his deathbed, he thought about that piece of ground that he stood on at six years old. And saw his daddy build an altar. It impacted him over a hundred years later. And there on his deathbed, he said, listen, family, God's going to visit you one day. God has shown me that he's going to come and take you and, and, and pull you out of Egypt. And he's going to take you back to the land that he promised Abraham and Isaac and, and our father Jacob. And when he does, don't you leave me here. I'm going to die, but don't leave me here. You carry my bones with you, and you bury them on that same piece of ground that I saw when I was a little boy that belonged to my daddy there in the land of Canaan in that Veil of Shechem. Let me, in fact, show you this, okay? Let me uh, bring up something. Let me show you where Joseph is buried in this land of Shechem, all right? It's not a place you can visit. Uh, It's in Palestinian territories, and you can't go there. I can, but you can't, okay? I'm standing on a mountain. The mountain's called Ebal. See that? That's Abraham's first altar that he built, okay? Down in that valley of Shechem between Mount Gerizim and Ebal. Okay, and uh, see this, oh, if you can see, uh, oh, there, see that little dome in the middle? That's Joseph's burial tomb. You see how it's cracked? That's because it's a very dangerous place, and it has been blown up because um, some Jews dared to go there in an armored car with, 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 uh, with troops all around them, but that didn't stop the Palestinians from throwing bombs and bombing them. Just, uh, and, and by the way, they still do that today. That's a very... Uh, it's a place that um, the Palestinians don't want the Jews to visit. And uh, we did a television program from there. Uh, and in fact, I've done uh, several from there and visited it several times studying the life of Joseph. And uh, this, uh, uh, we have to go uh, as well uh, uh, under protection. And uh, you can't see them, but there are guards around everywhere. And uh, see that? They blew a bomb, to, bombed it out there and blew it up because... Uh, Um, It is a holy site. This is where the bones of Joseph... This is the piece of ground that was purchased by Jacob from Hamor. And that is the tomb of Joseph's bones. Interesting, huh? Uh, It's been uh, severely uh, desecrated. And, uh, you know, even though uh, many try to protect it and clean it up and everything on that line, nonetheless, it is a very uh, 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 controversial piece of ground. It is one of the most hotly contested pieces of ground on planet earth. 
uh, there in this area. Uh, Jacob's well is just about, oh, um, um, a, a few hundred yards from there. And this uh, is right to below uh, Mount Gerizim, where the city of Samaria sets, and the Samaritans still live there. I wish I could take you there, but uh, I can't. Uh, and I have to go as, uh, um, with, with some protection and also, uh, anyway. That's where Joseph, can you imagine? Joseph, at six years old, was so impacted by what he saw his father do that a hundred years later, he wanted his bones to be carried back there. And in fact, they were. They carried Joseph's bones to every battle in the land of Canaan and cross, you know, they, they wandered in the wilderness with Joseph's bones for 40 years, you know, across the Red Sea with his bones, crossed the Jordan River 40 years later, went to every battle, and after all the land had been conquered in the last chapter of the book of Joshua, where Joshua is making his farewell speech, it's at that place where Joshua 24 and verse 32, some 500 years after Joseph had first seen his father build that altar, some 500 years later, Joshua now is burying his bones there. Wow. You see, what we do in front of our children can make a real impact. How we impress them our children, our grandchildren, and other young people. Young minds are watching. They're listening. And we have a chance to impact them. For them to see our dedication, our determination to serve the Lord. Have you found uh, 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 Genesis 37 yet? Okay? Okay. All right. Now we'll begin my sermon. Okay? That was just all a little history stuff. Okay. You ready? Genesis 37, verse number 2. This is the history of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brothers. And the lad was with the sons of Bilhi, the sons of Zilpah, his father's wife. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to his father. Joseph came and tattled on his brothers. They weren't taking care of the sheep right. Now, verse 3. Now, Israel, who is Jacob... Now. Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age. In fact, he was born to, to Jacob when he was, Jacob was 92 years old, 91 or 92. That's the son of your old age, huh? And uh, Jacob also made Joseph a tunic or a coat of many colors. But when his brothers, when Joseph's brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Verse 5, now Joseph had a dream. He's 17 years old and he had a dream. He told it to his brothers and they hated him even more. So he said to them, Please hear this dream which I have dreamed. He was trying to get them to, to, to just listen to me. Listen, listen to what God has shown me. Listen to what I've, what, what I've got in my heart. Listen to what I believe. You know, uh, he had a dream. 17 years old, Joseph had a dream. He was so impacted as a young man by how his father served the Lord. It set him up for the rest of his life. And at 17 years old, God visited Joseph and he gave him a dream about his future. He told it to his brothers and his brothers just thought he was bragging because it involved the sun and the moon and the 11 stars bowing down to him. And they said, whoa, you know, we know what that means. And mom and dad and all your brothers or some guy going to bow down to you. Are you crazy? You're just filled with pride. You're filled with arrogance. And, and, and Joseph was saying, no, 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 wait, please, please listen. Listen to the dream. But they just hated him even more. So much so that if you continue to read the story, you'll see that they sold him into slavery just to get him out of the house. They told his dad that he was dead. All because of a dream. You see, dreams continued to figure in heavily into Joseph's destiny. 
Joseph's destiny began with this dream. A dream that his father had first in Syria, then a dream that he had in the land of Canaan, and then dreams when he was in Egypt. Not only his own dreams, but the dreams of many other people figured heavily into Joseph's destiny. On several critical occasions in Joseph's life, God would either speak to him or speak to someone close to him in a dream. And that dream would position Joseph for a greater day. What is a dream? A dream is nothing more than a a strong desire, a fond hope, something that you might see that others don't see, something that might be real to you that may not be real to anyone else, something you're holding on to for the future, something that, that you're trusting for this future. A dream that Joseph had. God used dreams to position people. God's still using dreams to position people today. God's still using strong desire. God will still use something that you might believe, something you might hold on to, something you might hope for, that no one else sees, that no one else knows, that no one else believes, but he might use it in your life to still position you, to put you at the right place at the right time so that he can unfold his will in your life. Even Joseph's rise to fame in the house of the Pharaoh was due to a dream. Not his dream, but a dream that Pharaoh had. And Joseph was positioned for his greatest day again because of a dream. You see, when Joseph was a young man, he spoke of his dream. But when Joseph was an old man, his dream spoke of him. When Joseph was a young man, 17 years old, he talked to people about his dream. No one wanted to hear it. No one wanted to believe it. In fact, it made them angry. When he was a young man, he spoke about all that he had hoped would come to pass, all that he believed. He spoke of his dream. But when he was an old man, his dream spoke of him. Because one day his brothers did come and his family did come and bow down before him and he was able to lift them up. You see, it wasn't the end of his dream that they would just you know, make themselves subservient to him. But he lifted them up, protected them, blessed them, and saved them in their difficult day. Joseph was a dreamer. He lived in Egypt For 93 years, he was 110 years old whenever he died. But even there on his deathbed, Joseph was still a dreamer. In fact, Joseph had a dream that God gave him, a desire, a hope, something that he believed that no one else saw, something that he felt was true even though he could not prove it, is that God would one day come and visit the children of Israel and deliver them in an exodus out of the hands of the Egyptians and out of the bondage of slavery and take them back to the land promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And there he told his family again. He risked one more time telling his family of his dream 110 years old. In fact, he took an oath from them. He decreed and made them swear that when God shows up and delivers you, take my bones with you. Why? Because he had a glimpse of something greater than what he was experiencing. That's what a dream is. It's a hope of a better day. That's what a dream is. It's a glimpse that we catch at times of something that is better than what we now have. (laughs) And Joseph was a dreamer. That's one of the things I love about him. I think that's one of the reasons why he occupies 40% of, of the book of Genesis, of this book of beginnings, of the very first things that God wants us to know about himself and about life is that We can dream. We can look forward to a better day. Not just a better day when we're six years old. Not just a better day when we're 17 years old. Not just a better day when we're in prison. Not just a better day when we've been wrongfully accused. Not just a better day when we're in a hole of life. But a better day even when we're laying on our deathbed. We can lift up our voice and make our declaration that there's a better day ahead. 
catching the glimpse of glory as Joseph did, a glimpse of glory beyond the grave. Joseph was a dreamer. He dreamed about his life. He interacted with other people who dreamed about their lives. He interacted with those who dreamed about their nation. He interacted with those who dreamed about their freedom. He loved to be around people who were dreamers because he himself believed in a better day. Joseph rightly believed in the dream that God gave him even on his deathbed because certainly it came to pass. What do we learn from this dreamer that we can begin practicing in our lives today? In studying the life of Joseph and just reading through it as I encourage you to do, begin reading in Genesis chapter 30 and, and read through the life of Joseph all the way to the, to the end of Genesis and, and, and let God speak to you about this dreamer. But today what we can learn from him, what we can begin to apply in our lives today is number one, that God has a plan for our life. He really does. You see, God is intricately involved in our lives. God is the ultimate micromanager, if you will. Uh, if, if by micromanaging you mean that God knows every detail, he does. And that God orchestrates things and works things out, he does. The Bible tells us that all things will work together for good, for the good of those who love him, for those who are called according to his purpose. The Bible says that God even knows the number of the hairs on your head. You don't think he knows details? The Bible says that he knows you by name. He calls you by name. He knows you. Don't think for one moment that God does not have a plan for your life. A plan beyond your prison. A plan beyond your, your youth. A plan beyond your middle age. A plan beyond your greatest exaltation. A plan beyond your death. Do not think that God does not have a plan for you, a plan for the nation that you live in, a plan for the people that you serve, a plan for the family that you love. God has a plan. And God is busy working this plan. He's busy putting the pieces of puzzle into place. And even when we fail, even when we trip, even when something happens to us that we cannot understand, God will work with it. It will place it in his hand. It may not always be easy, and it may not always seem profitable, but don't give up. <laughs> you see, if it's bad, God is not finished yet. God has a plan for our life. The second thing that we learn that we can begin to put into practice in our lives today, don't discount dreams. We should never discount dreams. <laughs> you know, I like to say that I don't like to rain on anybody's parade. <clears throat> I like to meet people with dreams. Sometimes the dreams seem so far-fetched, but if you ever come and tell me a, a, a strong desire, a hope for your future, a, 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 you know, a, a, a thought of a better day in your life, you're going to watch me do a couple of things. I'm going to step back and put a smile on my face. I mean, it can, it can sound crazy to anybody, but I'm going to put a smile on my face because there's something I love about a dreamer, something I love about someone who has a dream for a better day. I like to be that person myself. You know, I'm constantly living in the future, looking for what God might do, dreaming, desiring, hoping of a better day. Because some days when you get up, life looks bad. It doesn't seem profitable. It seems like I'm in a hole, and this hole, you know, if you're not watchful, you can think it's just going to get deeper and last forever. But the fact of the matter is, that's what the world wants you to think. That's what the devil would like you to think. And that's what many people do think, but that's not the truth. God has a better plan. He has a greater day. Don't discount dreams. Don't discount your dream and don't discount the dreams of others. Just like Joseph was involved in the dreams of others. In Pharaoh's dreams. And helped to position Pharaoh because of the dreams in a place where, where Pharaoh was prosperous. Did not lose his kingdom and his people and his empire. But was able to make good have a greater day and protect his people. Just because it's not your dream does not mean that it is not God. And just because it's your dream does not mean that it will not affect you. Just because it's not your dream, brother, does not mean it may not affect you. 
Okay? Believe in the dreams of others. Most likely when you interact with people who are dreamers, the fulfillment of their dream will be a blessing to you, not a curse. Why discount dreams? Why discount someone thinking that they're going to do better tomorrow, that it actually is going to work out, that something good is going to happen? Why discount those dreams? Would you rather believe that nothing good is ever going to happen? Would you rather get into a hole of depression and worry and anxiety and fear and frustration and just you know, end up wanting to kill yourself? No. Why? Believe in a better day. Don't discount your dreams and don't discount the dreams of others. When others embrace their greater day, if you can just help them a little bit, no doubt their greater day will be a blessing to you as well. And a third thing we learn from the life of Joseph to, that we can apply to our lives today is that some dreams take time. You know, Joseph's dream didn't happen immediately. <laughs> In fact, it got worse before it got better. You know, he wanted to share with his brothers the dream. If you'll continue to read the story, they didn't want to hear it. They hated him even more. They put him into a pit and sold him into slavery. It took years and years and years and years for his dream to come to pass. Some dreams take time. Okay? Don't despair. Okay? Give your dream the time it requires. Don't give up on your dream just because it takes some time. You may have dream of just waking up one morning and not feeling burdened. You know, you may have a dream of being happy, something, something that seem, would seem simple of, 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 of being free, of, of not, not, not having to uh, uh, worry or be afraid. That may be your dream. Don't give up. God is busy working on the dreams he's given you, the better day that he has for you. He knows the thoughts he thinks toward you. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, they are thoughts of good and not of evil. Don't give up. Dreams take time. And sometimes they go through a couple of bumps before they're fulfilled. Don't give up on your dream. Some dreams take time. Number four, lastly, you remember God has a plan. We should never discount our dreams or the dreams of others. Realize that some dreams take time. And let me tell you for certain and for sure that without regard as to who you are, where you are, how old you are, what stage of life you are in, or what you have gone through, without regard to anything else, let me tell you for certain and for sure, we can still afford to dream. Don't stop dreaming. Just because you're 91 and your favorite wife doesn't have a son yet, don't, <laughs> don't give up your dream. Just because you're you know, living in a foreign country and, and you've not began working on all that you had hoped to be able to supply your family, don't give up. Just because you're separated from family or you're in a situation or, or today you're listening to me and you're in some prison of your own making or someone else has you bound, don't give up your dream. We can still afford to dream. One of the things that Joseph's life taught me you know, I've, I've been to the pit that his brothers put him in in Dothan to sell him out of. I've been to his grave. I've been, uh, I've, I've walked his steps. I've gone to Egypt where he went. You know, I've walked down through the places where Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob went down. You know, I've studied this man. And this one thing I have de decided for my life those of you that know me well, you know I'm this way, and Joseph helped me to be this way. I have decided that if God will so allow me, when I draw my last breath, I'm going to scream it as loud as I can. My greatest day is yet ahead. <laughs> I'm going to die with a dream. And if I'm willing to die with a dream, why should I not therefore 
live with a dream. Don't let anything or anyone stop you from dreaming. And if somehow you just don't have what it takes to muster one, let me pray for you right now. Let me pray that God would visit you even in your nighttime to help you see through the fog, the cloud, the difficulties. See through the confusion, the hurt, the pain, the frustration, the anger, the fear. And give you a hope of a better day. And then you hold on to it. Okay? <laughs> Listen, this is not all there is. Okay? I got a feeling Joseph's not in that grave. I got a feeling we're going to see him riding back on a white horse. Yeah. He dreamed of a better day. Let's be dreamers. Let's believe. Let's hope. Why not? Let me pray for you, would you? Bow your head and close your eyes. Father, Lord, I pray, Lord, that you would visit each one of us, Lord, with dreams, Lord, with hope, Lord, of a better day, Lord, without question, Lord, not only for ourselves, but also for others, Lord, that, God, we might receive from you. Speak to us, Lord, in our nighttime, God. Lord, help to see uh, through the darkness, through the confusion, through the fear, the anger, the hurt, the pain, Lord, the worry, God. Lord, to a glimpse of a better day, Lord, show us, almighty God, your dreams for us, God. We know you have a plan for us, and your thoughts toward us are good, according According to the prophet Jeremiah. Lord, now show us. Reveal to us, Lord, your hope and your dream for our lives. And God, we know you have a plan, Lord. God will not discount the dreams, Lord, the hopes, Lord, not ours and not others, Lord. And God, we understand it may take time, but God, we're going to keep dreaming, Lord. Keep believing in a better day because of you, because you lift us up. And you make us more than we could ever be by ourselves. Thanks, sir. Amen.